Hello, my name is Adrian Esposito. When I was little, I used to love to listen to my grandmother's stories about her life in Lithuania and especially her experiences during World War II. You see, when I was little, I was diagnosed with autism. I wound up with her during the day as I was terminated for many daycare centers. They just could not deal with my hyperactivity and unique style of play. However, she played with me and talked to me. I remember everything that she said. These stories stayed with me and I wanted to share them with others. More recently, I met other people whose lives were also transformed by World War II. I wanted to tell their stories as well. It is one thing to see newsreels of World War II. It is another to hear a real person's experiences and thoughts. We are quickly losing a generation that has much to teach us. Let's learn from their experiences and remember, those who do not study history are condemned to repeat it. What led up to World War II? There were many causes, but two stand out. There was the eugenics movements of the 1920s. It justified discrimination and rendered the lives of some worthless. Also, the worldwide economic depression led people to search for miraculous answers. In Germany, on one front, there was Hitler and his Nazis. They defined themselves as Aryans, Supermen, genetically and intellectually superior to all other races. Fueled by hatred, greed, and their belief in their own superiority, they redefined good and evil to suit themselves. Actually, Hitler hid behind the eugenics movement to justify the extermination of six million Jews. He also defined as inferior, the disabled, gypsies, homosexuals, and anyone not of Aryan background. Baptized as a Catholic, Hitler later rejected Christianity and persecuted Roman Catholic clergy and Jehovah's Witnesses, sending them to extermination camps. This led to the slaughter of another five million people. In Germany, discrimination became the law of the land. Modern research has indicated that the idea of an Aryan race was pure myth. It was a term invented by linguists to classify the similarities of ancient languages, not people. Also, in modern times, scientists studying the DNA makeup of human beings, the Human Genome Project, have concluded that human DNA is 99 to 99.5% alike. Any belief in one's race's superiority over another's is just not borne out by the facts. The Japanese also believed in their superiority and fought to take over the world. Their goal was to cover the world with a Japanese roof. For world domination, they followed the precepts laid out by the Tanaka Memorial, which was given to Emperor Hirohito in 1927. Here are the stories of innocent people, victims of their times, and the tyrants who were determined to force their way of life and thinking on the world. I am Christina Nomeka, and this is my mother, Yanina, and this is her story. My mother, Yanina Nomeka was born in Alitus, Lithuania. She was raised in an upper-middle-class Christian family. Her father was a Lithuanian railway administrator who provided his daughters with a good life. The girls were well-dressed, 
had a private seamstress and maid, and were taken to fashionable events such as concerts and plays. My mother's high school life was filled with activities. Music lessons, violin, piano, sports, volleyball, basketball, crocheting, knitting, dances, and dating. In 1939, there were forebodings of war. In Klaipeda, where she lived, there were incidents of local German youth attacking and beating up Lithuanian teenagers. Klaipeda, German language name Memo, was historically a Prussian state. On August 1939, more trouble brewed when Germany, led by Nazi leader Adolf Hitler, and Russia, led by Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin, entered into a series of pacts designed to help each other economically and politically. Known as the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact, also the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, the agreement publicly stated that the two countries, Germany and the Soviet Union, would not attack each other. They would remain neutral and refrain from acts of aggression if either went to war. Secret clauses partitioned Poland and the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. On September 1, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. Two days later, Britain declared war on Germany. World War II had begun. On June 15, 1940, on the day of my mother's high school graduation, the Russian army marched into Lithuania, occupying it. June 15, supposed to be our graduation. And uh, in the 12 o'clock at noon, the high school principal gave us diplomas and said, look, girls and boys, there will be no party or no ceremonies at 5 o'clock, you know, uh, for giving diplomas, because in two hours, the Russians will be moving the tanks through our streets. You just go home, and so we had all the girls had the pink dresses made, you know, and we were waiting for the nice dances and the nice party, you know, and ball. And that's it, we had to go home. So we went home and right three o'clock, the Russian tanks were moving through our streets and the, and the Russian army were, were marching marching through the streets. And so they started their first Russian occupation. Despite having a non-aggression pact signed and in force, Soviet Russia gave Lithuania an ultimatum in 1940. It ordered the removal and imprisonment of several key Lithuanian politicians and ordered the Lithuanian military not to resist. After much internal debate, the ultimatum was accepted and Lithuania was forcibly incorporated into the Soviet Union on August 3rd, 1940. On June 22nd, 1941, Hitler's army invaded the Soviet Union. The Lithuanian people revolted against the Soviets and declared an independent Lithuania. The aims of the Lithuanian nation, however, were contradictory to Nazi Germany's plans for Europe. On August 5, 1941, the Lithuanian provisional government was forced to cease, and in its place, a German occupation regime was established. Lithuania remained occupied by Nazi Germany from August of 1941 to the summer of 1944. German occupation starting. Russians were just one year, first occupation one year. Then the Germans occupation were, was four years, four years. 
especially they were taking young people forcefully, you know, to work in their war productions, you know, war munitions and everything else. Young women, they were especially, they were told, we are told not to go alone in the, in the street because the, the Germans were, you know, taking them to, to some kind of, lock them out for, for pleasure, you know, for soldiers. So it was a dangerous time, you know. We lived by the railway station, and once in a while we have seen masses at night, always at night, masses of Jews with kids, with, with small kids, late at night, with clinging pots and pets, and they were, they were, they were told that they were t being taken to the different station, different camp. Uh, but they were not, they were taken in the next wo woods and they were shot. But they were more shoots than some other places. They, they had to dig the, their own trenches and they were put in the trenches and they were shot in the trenches. And the kids were crying and so it was terrible what they did. The Lithuanians would interfere for killing the Jews. They would be shot themselves. No excuse. In spite of the German occupation of Lithuania, my mother's life went on to reach some normal milestones. She worked in a bank and on December 28, 1941, married my father, her music teacher, Mr. Zenonas Nomeka. He was a talented and well-known concert pianist and organist in Lithuania. Mr. Nomeka graduated from the L'Ecole Normale de Musique de Paris in 1936. He studied with the famous French organist and composer Marcel Dupré, who later praised him for his improvisational skills on the organ. His father was musician organist, so he became too musician, very talented. He was organ virtuoso uh -huh. and pianist, and he had a scholarship, Lithuanian scholarship in Paris to wow. study at Marcel Dupré. So he was his pupil. When he came, he was assigned as professor in music school. And I was going there. I was le learning student, student. And uh, I was assigned to him, to his class. I was 12 years old. Then I had to take piano lessons. Piano class, you must take, you know, yes. if you are an instrumentalist. So when he saw the first time, you know, he says, oh, who is this man, gentleman, you know, like from Paris, black suit with white stripes, beautiful, handsome man, you know. But I am 12, I am not interested in men, not yet. I had sports in mind and everything else. But he says, when he met me first time, he says, this, this girl will be his wife, but he has to grow up. And the wedding was in the Christmas time, second Christmas day, in church. In the church where the old churches were closed in Vilnius because it was epidemic of typhus fever. Lots of people died there that time. But we went, we went to church around the other door. And I said, well, it will, will be too, nobody will be there to empty church. And my husband says, because it's so cold outside, it was below zero, very, very cold. He says, you take the warmest dress because nobody will see you. But I had a beautiful white color lilies bouquet which I took with me to the church. I, I had a black dress, long sleeves, and a, that nice bouquet of white flowers. And when we entered, for our surprise, all Mr. Nomeka's friends 
gathered people with choirs. It was three choirs, and they started sing singing Vene Creator Domini, whatever. And I was surprised. I said, my gosh, you know, I had a wedding dress, blue dress, light blue, and I had a black dress for my wedding, you know, and I thought nobody will see it. But later on, we had a party at our home, and because nobody could go home late at night because it was curfew, they all slept and we, we were dancing and all night nobody were, were going home. And next morning we, we had a ball again, party again. So that was my wedding. Then I moved out from my father's and mother's home and we started our apartment with Mr. Nomeka. During their occupation of Lithuania, the Soviets formed a new government. This consisted of mainly known Lithuanians, such as poets, singers, and musicians. My father knew many of those in the newly formed Soviet puppet regime and spoke openly against the Soviet occupation and their tactics. He was soon put on a Soviet transport list of people to be exiled to Siberia but tipped off by friends, managed to escape by fleeing to the Lithuanian countryside. He hid in the woods until the danger had subsided. In June of 1941, the USSR deported over 35,000 Lithuanians to Siberia. Several thousand were killed in more than 40 massacres that occurred in various places in Lithuania. Most well known of these was the Rainé Massacre. In the summer of 1944, the Red Army reached eastern Lithuania. The German army started their retreat. Because my father was on a past Soviet deportation list, my parents decided that they could no longer stay in Lithuania and survive another Soviet occupation. They decided to flee Lithuania at the end of July 1944. Earlier that month, they heard about an assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler, July 20th, 1944. Hearing about this event, they hoped that the war would soon end and they could return home to Lithuania. And we had to move fast, so we ordered the box, somebody, the carpenters made the box for the piano and we wanted to send to Mr. Nomeka's mother at the village. And, and then he had a bust of, made by a good sculpture. We put back there, I had a violin that we packed there and we, we moved to the station, the railway station to be transported. And that night was big bombing. And the station was bombed and everything, we lost everything. Everything was completely burned out. So we had just whatever, a little back package to, for clothes and a couple sandwiches and we had to move. We moved almost with the last train from that city. So we moved, kept, kept moving and moving and moving, you know, to different cities, to Kaunas. Then we, we went to, to the village my, where my father's parents used to live. And there, you know, we heard at night, they say, they were, they were called Stalin organ, which was the cannons. So we says, we have to move now fast. So my, my husband says, I'm going to go alone and get the permit to different city to, to go to the Germany, to move to Germany. We can stay here. And, and he, you know, and he went, you know, to the station. Somebody took him to the station with horses and wagon. 
And then I thought, oh my gosh, you know, we might, we, we might never see each other again if, if the front moves, you know, and we will be separated. So I took a bicycle and I was running like crazy with that bicycle up and down the hills to the station. And the, the, the train almost started slowly, started moving. And I said, Zenonas, get out fast, get out. We're gonna go tomorrow together. So he get out, you know, and tomorrow or the same night we left, you know. We left the village and, and you know, we went to the station and, and he says maybe we can get, get somehow get on a train, but no trains were going, just military trains retreating from the front, German, Germans retreating from the front. So it was a train with open train, platform train with ammunition. So I went, you know, the soldiers were, were guarding and one was soldier, I went to that soldier and said, please le let us move with you, let us climb the, the t you know, to the, he says, look, if somebody will see you, I let you go, you know, I'll be shot myself. But he let us go, you know, and we were sitting quietly and the room was laying. And the airplanes came and started shooting at us, you know, at, at the train, of course. But it went okay, you know, we, we reached the Germans' border. And then, you know, we got a train to, to, to the Germany, to the middle Germany. When we came to Germany, we, we, have very fear, we, we had a big fear because they were checking documents on every corner. And they could have an excuse to arrest you any time. First of all, we had to get a permit for food cart. And then we, 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 you can't get, you can't get food cart if you are not working in the factory, in munition factory, everybody must work. And so he was, so he was sent to a munition factory, and we got our cards. One egg a month. One egg a month. I remember that. Yeah. Meat, very little. Uh, soup, 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 vegetable soup. No, no fat, nothing. Your grandpa looked like Italian. Dark hair, black, black hair. And uh, they all sometimes say, you are Italian. And the Germans hated, hated Italians. Because the Mussolini didn't, didn't want to listen to Germans. And they, they had a pact, you know. And they didn't listen. So they hanged the Mussolini and his mistress. I don't know the name. They hanged it too. They both hanged. So they were prejudiced against your husband? Yeah. Stopping him all the time? Yeah, it, it's dangerous. But he likes to speak back. And you can't do this with Germans. They are gods. We were traveling from Germany to Austria. But, but they saw Zino in the train wagon. And they says, what is he doing, that Italian? We were soldiers from the front. And we were standing, we had no seat. And he had seat. And he's he out, he out of the train. And I says, my gosh, says, the train is going. Let it stop. 
He will get out, but let the train stop. Uh, so we, when the train stopped, we went out. So then, you know, I and with my, with my uncle were in Berlin, visiting Berlin city. And that time, you know, my husband stayed alone, home alone. He didn't want to go. And then, then we hear an, uh, sirens about 12 o'clock, sirens, you know. We had to run like crazy to the bunkers. It was bunkers all over, you know, in the city, Berlin. We were running in the bunkers with my uncle, you know, and we were sitting in the bunkers there. And the radio was blasting with us. Now it's big bombardment in that section where, where my husband was. That section is completely bombed out, and it was American. Uh, in that section was American camp, you know, uh, prisoner camp. Um, that's why they were, they were bombing there. I said, oh my gosh. He says, no, no transportation to there. It's a uh, railway, um, bombed out everything, uh, railway tracks, everything. So I said, so how are you going to do now? Maybe my husband is dead now already, you know, bummed out. But right away we got, instead of train, we got buses from the city. The closer we went, the more destroyed it was, everything destroyed. And just when we came close to my house, it was the biggest hole, about two ton bomb, you know, hit there. Everything was out, no, no houses there. And just our little house were standing. Just our little house were standing. Because right in front of her, it was a statue of Holy Mary. And that saved. And it was bushes, big bushes too, all around, you know. That's probably some house shape. But bushes shouldn't save, you know, bombs. But my husband was in a, in a, in a cellar. And he says he, he, he was never so scared. He was praying on, on, on his knees, you know, because everything was shaking. All the dishes were on the floor, everything broken, you know. <laughs> everything was shook up. So he got scared, you know. And I was, when when was all kind of bombings, you know, I used to have, I used to be very quiet. No panic in me. I just says, nothing you can do. I was so, so strong that time, you know. And we were, we were going and then and we, we saw, you know, we saw the tree and the man was uh, hugging the tree, you know, and crying. He lost all the family, you know, and he lost everything. So many tragedies, you know, happened there. My grandfather, Yanina's father, was active in the partisan resistance movement in Lithuania. He was soon placed on a Nazi watch list. He was scheduled for deportation, but managed to escape. Later, my grandfather was taken by force by the Nazis and made to work in Germany for their railway system and the war effort. He died in Germany in a makeshift hospital set up in a restaurant. He died alone without his loving family. We still were living in that house and I received uh, uh, a letter from my father. And my father was alone, you know, he, Germans moved him with, with, with the, the last train from Lithuania by force, they moved him to Germany. And he, he was living in a small railway station someplace. And then the letter came just a couple days before Christmas that he is in the hospital, he is dying. He says, if you come, come to visit me. So boy, I was shocked, you know, and I don't know what's wrong with him, you know, because he says he is dying, you know, my father. And so I went to the Germans to, to, to get the permit to travel because you have to have a permit all the time. Everything is permit. And the German says, uh, and I showed the letter, but in Lithuanian, written in Lithuanian. And the German says, we don't know what's written there. You know, we don't trust. Everybody wants to, to travel. No one travels, just German soldiers for, 
vacations from front. And I was crying like something, please let me go, you know. So he says, okay, you can go and your husband won't be able to go. Just you alone. They let me go alone. But my husband went with me anyhow. He took a risk. They could shot him right on the, on the spot if, they, if he did, had no permit in traveling. So we went to, to, my, to the place where my father was staying. So, you know, I, I, I went, you know, to the, to the uh, hospital and my father says, you go and you go in to your husband, you know. I am getting old. He wasn't old. He was 56 years old. But he says, what are they going to do? I am sick. Whatever happens, happens to me. But you have to go back to your husband. It was a life of constant upheaval, always moving to escape the onward progression of the war in the Russian front. The Russians were surrounding and bombarding Berlin. Berlin was surrounded, and the Russians were coming in, you know. So my husband and I was, my husband went home, you know, alone because he had to play the organ at Christmas time in Berlin. And then I went to the station to get permit to get out of Berlin and get my husband there. And I went to the station and I told the officials, you know, this is, I, I want to pass Berlin uh, and get out, uh, you know, pass Berlin and get out of Berlin. I need a uh, permit. How many people? Two. Where is your husband? I says he is waiting with the baggage. That's a lie, you know, but I, I had to do this because otherwise you, you would not get out of Berlin. Everybody had to. And the men had to dig Berlin, you know, around Berlin to, to, to dig trenches, whatever, defend Berlin. So I, I went with the bus at our home. I said, pack fa fast, let's pack a couple baggages and let's get out of here. I have permit. So we packed fast, you know, back to the station. I said, let's go to the Switzerland border someplace, you know. Maybe we'll get to Switzerland. So we went to the station, you know, and in a couple hours, you know, before the train left, they bombed the station and, it, and the railway tracks. So we had to stay overnight in the, in the, in the basement there. And in the morning, they fixed the, tra the, ra the railways, and then we could, we could leave Berlin, and we left the Berlin. And on the way, you know, three days we traveled and the trains, you know, we had to get out, was bombed, the, the railways were bombed, you know, and bombing around. We had to move back to trenches, you know, outside and then go back in the train and travel again. No food, no water, we slept in some place in the railway stations, you know, underway. Friedrichshofen was the first station by the Bo Bodensee, by the, by the Switzerland border. And uh, we came out and the shack was just standing, wooden shack. The station was bombed out. You know, the building was bombed out. Nothing, was just a plain field, nothing, nothing left there. So we, my husband says, see the church there, let's go to church. Maybe we'll, we'll get some help there. So we, we went in there, and the, the priest says, well, I don't need organists because we have no parishioners left here. <laughs> but he says, go to the next station. He says, not, it's not much bombed, and maybe you will find a job, you know, as organist. So, but he let us wash up. He gave us food. You know, he treated us with warm food. It was nice, wasn't it? And we were strangers, completely, not even Germans. But see how Christians are. You have to feed hungry people. And then he gave us, uh, there was lots of apples there, apple orchards. He gave us a basket of apples to carry, you know, to, with us. And, and, and we went to this 
to the city he, he recommended. Then he was organized by the Salzburg. The, the Russians were coming again from the other side, from the Vienna side. We had to move again. Imagine that we have to run again from those Russians. So many times, you know, the Russians chasing us away. So my husband says, let's go again and move again. Let's go down that side. Maybe we'll meet American army because Americans were marching, French, French were marching, you know, England, English people were marching, you know, they're marching all over, you know, taking the Germany. And so we went to the station and we started moving towards, you know, where we, we thought we will, will meet meet Americans. And guess what? We saw the French army moving in, <laughs> marching right in. French army. My husband says, well, it's okay. I know French, you know, so it'll be not too bad, you know. And it wasn't bad. He met American, uh, French officers and they were so happy. They says, we need, we need a musician. We need somebody to to, to entertain us, you know, in our restaurant, you know, the the place where they meet, the officers meet. So he organized some kind of capella, you know, or some group of musicians there for them. And he, and he had a very good time there with them, you know, and he got food from them, you know, some cheeses, <laughs> cheese and something. So then we lived in that city. Ravensburg. After the war ended, my parents were placed in a displaced persons camp awaiting immigration to the United States. Their hopes of returning to Lithuania were permanently dashed when in August 1945 the USSR reclaimed Lithuania as a Soviet Republic with the agreement of the United States and Britain at the Yalta-Potsdam agreements. As a child, my father had been raised in the United States. He spoke perfect English and basically wanted to go home. My parents patiently waited their turn and arrived in the United States in 1949 on the first air flight of refugees, DPs, from Germany. In one of those years, your mother was born in Germany. And we had all the paperwork to come to the United States. We were put on the first airplane for refugees. And it was just for ladies with little kids. They put us on a plane instead of on a ship. And then we came to New York, La Guardia. And we were silky, circling around and circling around and we couldn't land because it was a big storm, snowstorm, terrible storm, cold and everything. And then, you know, they said, you people, brace yourselves to take a pillow, cover your head, head. We're going to crash landing because we are out of the fuel so we, and my husband says see now we reached in the united states and we gonna all die here before even you know to reach america america soil then we you know we crashed and we were sliding like without the wheels we just we're sliding with, with, with the airplane without the, the, the wheels, you know, like regular. And then it, we stopped, you know. L luckily, no one was hurt, you know. And, and we came to New York. And everybody, you know, different organizations, we were like a refugees. We were, we were special people, you know. So, Everybody came out and they were greeted by religious groups. Like we had, we were Catholics. So the Catholics greeted us 
we had with us is just a baggage what we can carry. And at that time, you know, I, I had lots of diapers, you know, dirty and, and, and diapers carrying. And I had to change your mother's diaper. And I, while I was changing on the table, the reporters came and started pi making pictures. I wish I could have those pictures of your mother being changed in LaGuardia Airport <laughs> to change your diapers. So then we went to the station, you know, to the office of, of Catholic organization, and they were started questioning, where, where is your contracts, where are you going, what work will you do, and my, my husband says, I am musician, and organist, you know, and the man who, who knew him, you know, he says, tell them that you are not just musician, you are very good or organ virtuoso, and you had all your diplomas from Paris and so on. You can go to, to, to work in the fields, you know. They need worker to work there. And we have to find you an organist job, you know. And, and so they called all around, and then they called Rochester, you know. And the priest says, bring him here, we will find him. We need the organist here. So instead, in our baggage, well, our luggage went to Pasadena by boat. And we came just with bag of diapers, you know, and some little change, change clothes to Rochester. And then Anas Nameka got a job as organist at St. Stanislaw Church. In America, my mother wanted to advance herself. She found a job at Bausch & Lomb in the factory. She was assigned what was called piecework. This involved competing for work and doing it fast if you wanted to earn anything. She wanted to get out of this grueling labor and studied office skills at night. As an immigrant, she faced ridicule and discrimination in her attempt to improve her situation. As time went on, my father got a job as a church organist, and eventually they both had a comfortable life. My father's career, however, never regained its momentum. He spent most of his life waiting for his big break to come. He gave organ recitals organized mostly by Lithuanian groups, but never achieved the recognition he deserved on a world scale. He died in 1976. My mother is now at St. John's Nursing Home, diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Dr. Chang was born to a well-to-do family in Xinyang, in the northeastern region of China, on December 23, 1920. His family sent him to good schools. Initially, he went to traditional Chinese schools, but later he was sent to Christian schools. His happy childhood was marred by the political events of his time. The world went into a financial depression in 1929. Most countries of the world went into turmoil. Japan was hit hard by these events. Unemployment was rampant and the Japanese government offered few solutions. Japanese military generals took this opportunity to further their goal of world domination. They convinced the Japanese people that invasion of China and other countries would bring needed industrial and financial resources for Japan. 
on September 18, 1931, when Dr. Chang was 11 years old, Japan invaded his homeland, Manchuria, which is now part of China. Uh, Japan invaded and occupied the northeastern region of China. Uh, back then, Eastern uh, ignited the, the invasion. The next year, 1932, uh, Fu Yi, the last emperor of China, uh, Japanese installed Fu Yi as a uh, chief executive of new Manchurian state to, to be called Manzhou Guo. Japanese used the, used the collaborationist of China to uh, establish the Manzhou Guo. Uh, it is basically is a puppet state of uh, Japan, Japanese. During the Japanese occupation, the period of uh, from 1931 to 1945, my father disliked the oppression from Japanese, the foreigner, and dislike increasing with age. The oppression including the feeling of a neither of a, a Japanese nor as a Chinese, but so-called Manchurian, and all kind of discrimination from Japanese was very upsetting and treating Chinese like uh, slaves. Even now, my father said, I could not recover emotionally from disliking the Japanese. 1937, the Chinese government declared the war officially against the Japanese. Marco Polo Bridge incident ignited the war. At that time, my father, he is, was a high school student. Uh, Chinese people in Manzhou Guo finally felt a sense of hope to be free from oppression of Japanese. Their hopes were dashed when they heard of the encroaching victories of the Imperial Japanese Army. Just six years after the Japanese invasion of Manchuria, Emperor Hirohito and his generals set their sights on mainland China. In August of 1937, the Japanese started bombing Shanghai and Nanking. In spite of strong Chinese resistance, the Japanese were victorious and then marched on to overtake the walled capital of China, Nanking. Sensing defeat, many abandoned the city. Those fleeing included Chiang Kai-shek, the head of the Chinese Nationalist Army. He fled with his family and top generals. On December 13, 1937, facing scant resistance, the Japanese invaded Nanking. For those left in the city, the nightmare began. What followed is historically known as the Rape of Nanking, or by the Chinese, the Forgotten Holocaust. The facts of these events are disputed by the Japanese even to this day. In a three-month period, 
approximately 300,000 Chinese civilians and soldiers were beheaded, bayoneted, mutilated, burned alive, and savagely gang raped. The Japanese even made a game of killing defenseless Chinese civilians, as shown here being praised in this Japanese newspaper. Reports of the brutality of the Japanese Imperial Army came from all over China and even other conquered territories such as the Philippines. In 1941, when Dr. Chang was a sophomore in college, he decided to join the underground resistance movement. On May 23, 1945, he and a thousand other resistance fighters were captured by the Japanese in Changchung. Uh, he felt a sense of failure after being captured by the cruel enemy Japanese. During a period of uh, interrogation, the physical suffering was severe, but the spirit and the conviction of the eventual victory remains high. He disliked Japanese very much. Even now, again, he could not recover from disliking them emotionally. Le and he learned the lesson of the war. He believed invasion is wrong, defense or resistance is necessary. Was he tortured in prison? Uh, yes. Yeah. On August 10th, 1945, the Soviet Union invaded Manchuria the Japanese started to retreat, taking prisoners along with them. Dr. Chang was on such a march when he was rescued by his comrades on August 14th. Japan officially surrendered on August 15th, 1945, ending the war. To this day, Dr. Chang continues to have nightmares about his captivity. He often jumped while sleeping due to the nightmares about past captivity and that stunned my, my mother every time. My feeling is that, like I told my son, the war is very cruel and my experience of in prison in prison, it's, it's hard to tell in detail, but anyway, it was painful and severe. And uh, I don't like war anymore. I just don't think war is right. It doesn't change the world at all. Uh, and especially the invasion of one country to another, one nation to, to another people, that's just wrong. You cannot do that. You're not supposed to do that. So when, when I was young, and when, I, when the Japanese invaded China, that's a, a painful experience. So uh, to me, I'm against the war, but I, I think the resistance of the enemy, that's the right thing to do. Still, I still think that's the right, that's right. Dr. Chang went on to study medicine and became a practicing internist. He met his wife, Xi Ping, a nurse during this time. 
Eventually, they immigrated to the United States, where Dr. Chang continued to practice medicine. His experience of America has been a very positive one. How about Japanese? No, I, I, I still don't like them emotionally, but I cannot say I hate them. Not all Japanese were ruthless and brutal. During this time period, two Japanese heroes emerge, Chunei and Yukiko Sugihara. They are credited with saving the lives of over 6,000 Jewish refugees during the summer of 1940. A career Japanese diplomat, Chunei Sugihara, was assigned to the post of Vice Counsel of the Japanese Consulate in the country of Lithuania. As the war encroached and borders closed, Jewish refugees streamed into Lithuania looking for an escape route through the east. Moved by the desperation of the refugees who crowded around the embassy, some even climbing the compound walls, Chunei, aided by his wife, wrote exit visas tirelessly. Taking little time to sleep, he continued to grant visas, even when the embassy was officially closed and his government ordered him to come home. He made the decision to save lives, even when his country emphatically told him to stop. In 1985, in recognition of his acts, he received Israel's highest honor. He was recognized as righteous among the nations by the Yad Vashem Martyrs Remembrance in Jerusalem. When asked why he did it, he responded, they were human beings and they needed help. A deeply religious man, he also was fond of saying that God's laws come first. Despite pressure from the Germans to hand over the Jewish refugees or kill them, Japan protected the group and never returned them. Many refugees immigrated from Japan to Israel and to the United States. As a 10-year-old child, Kurt Weinbach saw a triumphant Adolf Hitler entering Austria. When Hitler entered Austria, I was on the main highway that led into Vienna, and there were hundreds of thousands of cheering, maddened people who were cheering him, whether he said or didn't say anything, didn't make a difference, nobody could hear him. He went down and to his royal and glorious takeover. I once again saw him a few weeks later when he gave his speech in front of the Imperial Palace in Vienna, where he stood in front of one of the big horses they had there with one of the former emperors. And I had the fortune of standing on another horse, so I near, near another horse rather, and see him. And also because I had to hold on for life, I didn't have to salute him. And the other millions of people were screaming and shouting. But not all of Austria's military shared Hitler's racist views. One such Austrian general, Captain Heinrich Stumpel, used his influence to save his Jewish friend, Israel Weinbach, and his family from certain death. Well, we got out with tickets provided through the general, not by the general, which were first-class tickets for a very expensive, very long trip through Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, which was already destroyed and occupied, through the Soviet Union, all the way to Japan, then to Shanghai, and later on to North China. It was all, all arranged through the general, through the Gestapo, and through the Jewish community. Israel Weinbach met Captain Stumpel during World War I. My father was in the Austrian army for two years before that, and when the war broke out in 1914, he was with the Austrian army actually in Sarajevo. 
and then they shipped all of them to Russia and he became the photographer because nobody else at that time knew much about photography and he was one of the few and nobody had a camera nor was it allowed and anyhow even World War II they didn't allow cameras usually for the soldiers for espionage reasons so he took pictures mostly to send home for the so officers not the soldiers to families because this was their only contact for four years since they never got home he was the only one who got home and to their homes. Captain Stumpel and Israel Weinbach lost contact with each other after World War I. The next time they met was in Habsburg, Austria. My father had no contact with him between 1918, when the war ended, First World War, and 1938, when he was promoted to three-star general and appointed to commander-in-chief. Actually, he was the commander of Austria, but because the Germans did not want to admit that Austria was an independent country, so they made him commander of Vienna, called Stadtkommandant, which means city commander, although really he was for the whole country. And at that point, my father contacted him somehow, and he had an office in an imperial palace and my father was invited to come and visit him. And when we came there, like I said, it was in one of the imperial palaces, which later had been destroyed. And as we got there, we had difficulty because my father's name was, first name was Israel, which meant that he was Jewish and Hitler had just received the power. And when he came to the military headquarters in Vienna, and said he wants to see the commander-in-chief. They told him to get lost, especially when he announced his name. He couldn't be recognized as being Jewish. They told him to get lost and said, no, I have a letter of invitation. And they went down the line or up the line and called the corporal of the guard, the sergeant of the guard, and out all the way to the commander of the guard. And they all told him get lost until they said, no, there's a real letter and therefore you have an appointment and therefore you can go upstairs in this Imperial Habsburg Palace in Vienna. And we went upstairs and there was a huge elegant waiting room in which all the big shots were waiting for an for appointment called an audience really. And that included some of the late the leaders of the Gestapo and the German police and military and we came in and we were, uh, I came in with him because in case they wouldn't let him out or arrest him or something, I would probably, they let me out because I was only 10 years old. And I, but I understood the situation pretty well and went in, announced ourselves and pretty soon the general came out in his imperial uniform, which included red uh, pollards red stripes on his pants, shining boots, uh, corset underneath, and looked like a general should. And we do have a picture of him. And uh, came out, and pretty soon they made an announcement that everybody will have a delay because he has an important appointment. And amongst the people waiting, I should notice that there were such important or horrible people like Eichmann, who was waiting in for until he got my father in and I can continue here. He received my father, he chastised him because it was 20 years since he had seen him or my father had made any attempt to contact him. And then he said, okay, sit down. I know the situation, I know you're Jewish, I know what's happening, but as long as I can, I will protect you and guard you and see that you get out of Germany if necessary. Colonel Stimpfer was not a Nazi. He was a military man who believed in uh, the job he had. He also was a good Austrian, actually came out of the original Habsburg dynasty people. And there were others, including a moment I can just think of Rommel and other important, but Hitler had a very good policy or bad policy. He would not touch a general and he even had a case where Hitler wanted to recruit his own commander 
uh, to get to become a general, and his that was his captain in World War One, and the guy refused. So he gave him a job as general counsel in San Francisco, and there he worked for the FBI. And then the Germans found out and they shipped him to China and gave him a job in Tinsin, China as Consul General. And there he helped Jews all throughout the war. He helped Jews work there. An example, there was a German hospital and any German Jew during Nazi times could get free treatment there. And he helped to the end, but Hitler generally would not touch a general until they actually tried to kill him. That's different. But otherwise, he would have tremendous respect for the military. Some Austrians defended their Jewish friends during these dark times. During Kristallnacht, they actually helped us. My father had a watchmaker and jewelry store, and they actually helped us by standing in front of the store and barricading the store so the stormtroopers who came to destroy it or confiscate something, they couldn't get in. And so the store was not damaged, although by that time, for a certain reason, there couldn't be any merchandise any much more anymore. And a few days later, we came, went to the Gestapo, that was the secret state police, and my father came in and said he wants his keys back because they had padlocked it. And they said, you dirty Jew, get out of here. And she says, no, he's not getting out. He wants the keys. And who do you think you are? He says, you ask Lieutenant General Stimpfel. He'll tell you who I am. And they gave him the keys back, but that didn't help anymore. Kurt Weinbach and his family left Austria and immigrated to China. The China I knew at that time was Japanese occupied. And the Japanese were other people who saved more Jews from that Holocaust than the United States, including President Roosevelt. Because the Japanese owed the Jews a debt for something that happened in 1904 in the war between Japan and Russia. And they fully achieved that. The Chinese actually had very little to do with it, although they, they were just fine. Did you witness any brutality against the Chinese by the Japanese army? Yes, but in a very mild way. The, the worst I experienced or saw was when a Japanese officer who was acting as a guard, he was actually a bank vice president and a friend of mine, so a Chinese uh, man walked by and who forgot to pay the proper attention he was supposed to, like bowing down a little bit, taking his cigarette out and stop reading. And that Chinese man didn't do it, so he got hit with a rifle butt. He was waiting for his family, who were all dressed up in their beautiful old Japanese clothing, to go to the park. And uh, after this happened, and I talked to him, I went and walked with him, because the wives walked behind usually, and walked with him and chastised him. He says, I don't hate the Chinese. I like them, but he was insulting the emperor. He wanted to exploit me a little bit to learn English, and I want to exploit him to learn Japanese. So we used to walk around together and became friends. And that one day, one month, one day a month, his duty was to be a guard, although he was vice president. Kurt Weinbach had a strange clue that Japan was about to enter into a war. I found it out four days before Pearl Harbor by being attentive to a certain building that never had a padlock in China and now had one. And I asked a four-year-old Chinese kid who couldn't read or write in any language, couldn't, never owned a newspaper, and I asked him what happened here. Why is there a padlock? He said, well, the war is breaking out in a few days. And then I found out, of course, when the Japanese occupied the area, we had temporary housing 
in the extension of a Jewish hospital, which had previously been a British army hospital, and the Japanese did not know about it. So they tried to smash in, but we explained it to them, and that was the end of that. Mr. Weinbach was in China during the rest of the war. He witnessed the nuclear bomb explosion in Japan from his home in China. Actually, I saw an explosion. I was in a resort on a beach and I saw a huge bomb, or a blast rather, cloud. And I was a few hundred miles away, so I wasn't hurt much. I, had, I still have a slight, slight I injured from it and had no idea for a few weeks what had happened because we had no communications, no newspapers, no radios, no televisions down there. And that's how I found out. We're now in Tenzin, China, 1945. The war has ended after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I was in Tenzin, China. The Japanese were full occupation there, but they had of legally stopped the war. And I was walking along a side street, and there was a guy whom I identified as an American colonel, and came up to him, and he was trying to look at the map and tried to help him. And it turned out that his job was to find billeting, which means housing, for about 40,000 Marines going to come in in a few weeks. And he said, would you like to help me? I said, oh, gladly. It was a well-paid, unpaid job. And uh, I went with him and we confiscated buildings where they could put in all these thousands of Marines who were coming in from Okinawa, who had really been saved by the atomic bombs. And we went around and we had a sticker. I got a pad. And after we saw like a police building, a big building and we decided, oh, that was good. I took out a sticker and it said, in the name of the President of the United States, Harry S. Truman, I hereby confiscate this building. And that was it. And pretty soon, in one day, all these thousands and thousands of Marines came by ship, by plane, by landing craft, and thousands of planes above. And they just, made a very good impression and scared everybody. And eventually, in a few weeks, the Japanese had a full surrender, much to our scare, they may change their mind and fight, continue to fight. And that was it, and it was the end of the war for us and for them and for everybody. What is a message that you would like to convey to the world via this interview? Well, the message is, Watch out who your friends are and who your enemies are. In our case, of course, the friend turned out the German general. But even then, because I was very angry that the United States did not take in immigrants and refugees when they had to, and Japan did, and I am angry at President Roosevelt for that too, including shipping back refugees who had arrived in the United States. So my message is be alert and remember who your friends can be. They can be red or green, but they can be on both sides and the enemies are also on both sides. Hitler brought darkness across Europe, but he thought of himself as a prophet. He said, by warding off the Jews, I am fighting for the Lord's work. He duped a civilized, cultured, Christian nation into doing the unthinkable, killing children, massacring families, torturing and killing decorated German war veterans who happened to be Jewish and ultimately attempting to eliminate an entire race of people. As the Jews were gradually stripped of all their rights, many tried to escape. At least 37,000 immigrated in 1933, but many hoped that this storm would pass. 
They regarded Germany as their country and home. My name is Inga Auerbacher. I was born in a little village in southwestern Germany called Kippenheim. Kippenheim is located near the French and Swiss border at the foot of the Black Forest. We were a population of about 2,000 people with 60 Jewish families. And our feelings were quite religious. At the center of our lives was the synagogue. We had very good uh, relationships with our Christian neighbors. They went to church on Sunday, we on Saturday. I was the last Jewish child born in Kippenheim. And we had a big house, many rooms, and we owned that house for many, many years. And my father was a, a merchant, a textile merchant, and we were very comfortable. Many times I visited my grandparents about 200 miles away where the children were all Christian. My grandparents in that village were the last Jewish family living there. And I had wonderful times there. My grandfather was a cattle dealer and I would go into the stable. The smell did not bother me. My grandmother had a little garden and I used to go there. And it was a very happy time. In Kippenheim, I had only Jewish friends. And I remember not that much anymore there because I was quite young uh, when we left. Hitler was elected in free elections. In 1923, the Nazi party received one million votes. In 1930, they received 6.4 million votes. In 1932, in the last free election before World War II, they received 13.7 million votes. In March of 1933, Hitler was given unlimited executive power. Now, we really did not want to leave Germany. We were very, very proud German citizens, and we always felt, oh, that guy Hitler, it's only a short time and he will be gone again. I mean, the Germans are intelligent enough that they will not accept a leader like that. History reveals Kristallnacht was not a random act of violence by a few thugs. It was a planned event. Prior to Kristallnacht, the fire department and police were warned ahead of time and given instructions to let Jewish homes and synagogues burn. All of Germany and in Austria, where all the houses of worship, our synagogues, were either set to the torch or badly damaged. In our town, it happened on November 10th. And I remember my grandparents came to see us, and my grandfather, who was very religious, went to the synagogue in the morning to say his morning prayers. He was arrested and sent to Dachau, the first concentration camp in Germany. All men, boys actually from the age of 16 were sent to concentration camps during that time. In our area it was Dachau, in some other areas it was Buchenwald. The police came to our house, arrested my father only because he was Jewish. Then the rumpus began and they started to burn the synagogue, but there were Christian houses nearby. 
so they feared that the Christian houses would go up in flame too. And they demolished the inside of the synagogue very badly. They took out our holy scrolls, ripped them apart. All the windows in the Jewish houses were broken. I remember standing in the living room with my mother and my grandmother. I was only three years old, just before my fourth birthday, because I was born December 31, 1934. Standing in the living room, glass all around, and I remember one of the hoodlums looked at the chandelier and he yelled out, look, the chandelier is still hanging through a big rock through the broken window and it nearly hit my head. My mother just pulled me away and we were hiding then in a backyard shed to protect us. And this went on, the yelling, the screaming, only women and children were left in the village. And it, it was a very terrible time. I was extremely afraid, but I remember it so clearly as it happened today. And somehow at night, the rumpus start, stopped. There were no men in the village anymore. The children from 16 on, the boys were gone. And a few weeks later, somehow they permitted to come to permit the uh, men coming home again from Dachau. Certainly they were all broken down. They were beaten. My father, who happened to have been a disabled war veteran, highly decorated from World War I. It didn't matter. When they were in Dachau, they had to wear the uh, striped uniform. No underwear stand. I was at attention. If somebody even as much as wanted to blow their nose, they were hosed down with ice cold water. That happened to my father a few times. As a result of Kristallnacht, 91 Jews were killed, hundreds beaten and 267 synagogues desecrated and destroyed. Jews were blamed for the pogrom and had to pay one billion Reichsmarks for the damages. So we decided, this was in 1938, and a few months later we decided we must leave Germany anyway, anywhere. We sold a house at a cheap price, moved in with my grandparents in Jebenhausen, which was a few hundred miles away, in the uh, province of Württemberg. I was born in Baden. Today it's all one state. Hoping to get out. Jews gradually lost all of their rights and were separated from the other citizens. In September 1935, the German parliament, the Reichstag, passed the Nuremberg Laws, which made discrimination legal. In the end, Jews lost their citizenship and were barred from holding any civil service jobs, teaching jobs, or performing as artists before German audiences. Their businesses were confiscated and property seized. Also, closed to Jews were libraries, theaters, and public transportation. It was time to start school. In 1941, I'm six years old, Jewish children were no longer allowed to attend the regular schools in that uh, town. Uh, I had to travel, first of all, to walk about two miles to the train station. I was not allowed to take the bus and then take the train close to an hour to Stuttgart, which is the capital of Wittenberg. And that was the only Jewish school for the whole state. There was an order that came out in 1941, in the fall, that all Jews from the age of six years and up had to wear the yellow star. And I have a star here. I wore this star. It had to be sewn to our clothes over the heart. I remember sitting on the train. I was all by myself. And my father said, sit in such a way that you can naturally cover up the star. In other words, lean towards the left window if you could do that. 
And I remember only one time that I saw some kindness. The Christian Germans were not allowed to speak to us, but one lady saw this little Jewish girl and she felt sorry for her and she placed a bag, a brown paper bag with rolls next to my seat. She did not say one word, but in her silence, she spoke louder than anybody screaming. And to this day, I never knew her name. I will always remember the kind deed that this lady did for me. So you never know in life, when you do a kind thing, that it pays off tenfold at least, and people do remember. Now, the transports to the east, to the camp, started in that area in 1941. In my hometown, had we still lived there in Kippenheim, they started already in 1940, and all the Jewish people who were still left living there were sent to a camp in France called Gurs. Of course, from Gurs they didn't, uh, they were transported to other camps, and the final a destination uh, for them mostly was Auschwitz, the gas chamber. So in 41, the transports began from that area of Germany where I was living in the state of Württemberg. And one day we got our orders for transport. By the way, my grandfather died soon after he came out of Dachau. And the, the cause was really a bad heart, a broken heart, both physically and spiritually. He could not believe that the country he loved and respected could do such a thing to him, could handle him so badly. And he died, he was in his late 60s. And we got the transport. Uh, we got our numbers and everything, the papers, and my father, who had been already an alumnus of Dachau, he knew how things were working, decided to write a letter to the Gestapo, the secret police. And somehow, and he said, he showed pictures of his wounds, he would never be able to, uh, could never raise his right arm again. He was um, hit very badly as a young German soldier, for which he got the Iron Cross. And somehow we got out of that transport, but not my beloved grandmother. I shall never, ever, ever forget the farewell of my grandmother. I had the opportunity to see her go down in the Stuttgart railway station. And I can never forget that last scene as she walked slowly, slowly down the stairs. I wanted to hold that second, that picture forever. I would never see her again. She was killed, I found out later, in a forest near Riga, in the Birkenike forest, which by the way, I visited some years, a uh, few years ago. I had to say officially goodbye to my beloved grandmother. We got our orders again in August of 42, and this time there was absolutely no way to get out of that transport. We were about 1,200 people. I was the youngest, and I remember how we prepared for that trip. They gave us a directive. A lot of things you can take along, which of course they took at the end of the trip. And my mother, although it was summer, it was hot in August. She put a few layers of clothing on me, just hoping that I would have some clothes. Who knew what would happen? And I remember being sent, in every little town would gather the people, and the main transport was put together in the big city of Stuttgart, the 1,200 people. I became number Roman numeral 13-1-408. I was no longer Inge Auerbacher. I was that number. Incidentally, also at that time, 
all Jewish females had to take the name, the middle name of Sarah. The men had to use the name Israel to show that they were Jewish. And we were gathered in the school gymnasium. By the way, the house was taken away. As soon as my grandmother was taken away, they threw us out of her house. We never sold that house, my grandparents' house. They said, put the keys on the table and leave. So we, had, we're, we were sent to Jewish houses in Gerpingen, the neighboring town, bigger town. Um, and it wasn't a really nice area, but they permitted the Jews to live in a certain area, only Jewish people in, in these houses. And from there, as I said, we were in the transport. And I remember the school gymnasium. They said they were long tables. Take everything out on the table. And I had a little Dutch boy pin pinned to me. And one of the uh, um, people there, the uh, Nazi uh, guards, said to me, yelled at me in the Swabian dialect, "Do push this net for do engage," meaning. You won't need this where you're going to. And I had my doll, my beloved doll, who my grandmother gave me for my second birthday in my arms. He ripped her from, from me. And he uh, pulled the head up. She was hollow inside. She was put together with rubber bands. And he probably thought I was hiding something inside. But I wasn't. And I really made a fuss. And he gave me back the doll, which I gave to the Holocaust Museum in Washington a few years ago. And this was something that became my means, my idea of living, my, my support during all those times. My doll was always with me, and especially the memory from my grandma, my beloved grandma. From there, we were sent to Stuttgart to meet all the other people, the 1,200, about 1,200 people. We were housed in two huge halls for about two nights, where a few chairs around, sleeping on the floor. People were going crazy. They were screaming and hollering. And we went, and then the trains were ready. And it was not a cattle car. It was a regular train, very, very crowded. And the SS was on our train, the stormtroopers. And I remember whenever I got upset, and I was very upset that day, uh, though at that time, I would get sick to my stomach. So here I am, uh, I'm very sick to my stomach on the train and to the dismay of the other people. We couldn't do a thing. And we were there about two days, a train ride. We really didn't know where we were going. We arrived in a town in Czechoslovakia. We were told, get out, drop everything, just take your a blanket, a small knapsack, and your metal dishes. We were not allowed to take any knives, forks, anything sharp with us. Only these metal dishes that are like army ration uh, dishes. And we dropped everything and we started to march. And they were beating us with whips. I was seven years old at that time. And my parents put me beside, you know, they stood beside me that I should not be whipped. And we marched about two kilometers into the camp. And the camp was Terezin, as it is called in Czechoslovakia, in Czech. In German, Theresienstadt, it was actually an army garrison town that was built in the late 18th century. It was completely sealed off with high walls, barbed wire, and wooden fences. The Riesenstadt, a walled military town in Czechoslovakia, was turned into a ghetto in 1941, and a year later into a concentration camp. And the site of a Nazi propaganda film called Hitler gives the Jews a town. The film attempted to show how well the Nazis treated the Jews. It depicted the residents playing sports matches.
and children participating in plays, such as the famous children's opera, Brundabar. It showed them leading normal lives. In truth, the film was a lie, and most of the residents and children were later exterminated at Auschwitz. Of course, they checked us over there again. I remember my mother said she had a, she kind of kept a hot water bottle with her, a thermos bottle. She sneaked it up to that point, and she put it in a certain area. Of course, we never saw that area again and they searched us once again in these underground cells, uh, the Schleuse. And then we were sent to a huge brick barrack called the Dresdner Kaserne, an army garrison type of building. All bricks, red bricks, landed up in the attic of this uh, place. It was very hot up there. There were just tiny little windows, no beds, absolutely nothing. We were living, sleeping on a barren floor. And I never saw a dead person before. I was not even allowed to go to the cemetery when my grandpa died, but I was five years old at that time because my parents wanted to spare me. But here, I saw all these white sheets on the floor. There were bodies underneath. It was scary. Then I joined my parents who lived in what was called the Disabled War Veterans Section. And that was a little bit unique because uh, the families could live together because in terrorism, most men, women, and children lived separately. They could still see each other. It was, terrorism was like a holding area, like you hold uh, pigs or cattle or any, any animal before the slaughter. We did not have gas chambers at that time there. There were many beatings and so forth. If you did something or if you were caught, especially by, there was one SS man, his name was Heindel, and we were caught one day. It was very awful, very awful. Um, it was November 11th, 1943. And um, they said a count out had to be taken and they uh, placed us, they marched us out very early in the morning, everybody. I mean, the camp had at any one time 50,000 people. Through the three years, uh, they had 140,000. Two thirds would be shipped out, close to a third died there of malnutrition, dysentery, typhus, and other diseases, tuberculosis, etc. And we were marched to this field and they were counting us and beating us, and the guns were pointed towards us. It was like a ravine, Bolshevitsa Kessel, it was called. And probably the idea was much more sinister because they knew how many people were there. They said maybe some people got away, the numbers didn't check. Uh, probably they had other sinister ideas to kill us on that day. And my mother, they at the end of the day, they uh, said men, women, and children separate, and we did not, we held on to each other. And one of the SS men, could have been Heindel, uh, beat my mother very badly with the butt of a rifle because she was holding on to us. And to me, that was a day that I will never forget. I mean, my mother gave up hope altogether. It was very frightening, especially for a young child. There was also a beautification uh, there uh, when the uh, International Red Cross finally became interested and they demanded, they were actually pressured to see one of those camps where the people being killed there, uh, what was happening. So they beautified, of course they knew uh, 
that they would come. So they chose Terrazin and they used only a certain area that they would show them. And only the healthiest people would be shown. I was not in the film. They made a film at that time, which is still, bits and pieces are still available. They put signs up, to school, to playground. None of these things existed. We did not have real school. We had some illegal classes, and they were called Beschäftigung, keeping busy classes. Um, it was a little bit worse for the German children. The Czech children, many of them lived in these dormitories, and they had some good teachers there. And also, it was not allowed, but they taught them something uh, at that time. I was not privy to that. I had no school during that time. Just whoever taught us a little remembered something. For instance, I learned a little poem in English even. Somebody remembered the poem, I wish I were a little bird up in a bright blue sky that sings and flies just where he will, and no one asked him why. We wanted to fly away from this dreadful place. We were about 15,000 children in Terrasen, and most of them were sent to Auschwitz to be killed. About maybe about 1% or so under the age of 15 survived. There are some other numbers given. I do not remember many children at the end of the war who survived there. They were all killed. Towards the end of the war, Hitler wanted to escalate the extermination of the Jews and was pushing towards those ends. While Adolf Eichmann wanted to use trains to get German soldiers to the front, Hitler wanted to use them to transport as many Jews as possible to death camps. Hitler's obsession with the extermination of the Jews remained with him till his death. The final sentence of his political Last Testament reads, Above all, I obligate the leaders of the nation and their following to a strict observance of the racial laws and to a merciless resistance of the poisoner of all peoples, international Jewry. Now, liberation, the day that we absolutely prayed for. And by the way, I never lost my faith in God. My father found a little prayer book in the garbage by somebody who was sent to Auschwitz. He Either he lost his faith in God, or he just didn't want to take it with him. And that little prayer book became my constant companion. A little, probably he had it as a soldier. Liberation came on May 8th, 1945. It was the last day of the war in Europe. But just a few days before, there was, I heard the trucks moving out. And I remember climbing a barricade. And I heard a tremendous noise. I thought my brain flew out of my head. And I clutched my head if my head was still there. And they were throwing hand grenades into the camp, trying to kill still some people. The, the uh, German population and the Nazi, well, whoever was there, even some uh, Czech, uh, um, you know, policemen, whatever, who guarded the uh, camp, they ran away. And I saw a lot of black paper floating through the air. They were burning the records. And when I heard that noise, when the hand grenade was thrown in, I ran to my parents' side. And my father, having been a soldier in World War I, he said, we must find a place to hide. They're throwing hand grenades now. So we went down a dark cellar. We didn't even know. It was like a hole in the ground. And somebody had a little candle, a piece of a candle, and we sat there. And I took my little prayer book with me, and I never prayed so hard in my life. Special Hebrew prayer, which is equal to the Our Father, this is your Christian holiest prayer, I believe. And ours is Shema Yisrael, which means God is one. Here, Israel, God is one. It is a prayer that is said at the lips of the a dying person and when you're in dire need of something, it's our holiest prayer.
prayer that we, we pray to God. And I, I continuously said that prayer. And somehow about 10 minutes to 9, as I remember it, somebody went upstairs. He was really brave to see what's going on. And he said, we're free. The Russians are here. We couldn't believe it. I didn't take my clothes off the whole night. And we were liberated. And the nightmare was over. But was it really over? Who would still be alive? We lost at least 13 members of our immediate family. And by the way, we could not go home right away. There was a tremendous typhus epidemic in the camp. So it was isolated. It was even written up in the New York Times. And after a few weeks, a, tr a bus came from Stuttgart to pick up the surviving uh, people. There were a few transports that came to Terrace, and we were the first one. From our transport, about 13 people survived out of 1,200. An absolute miracle uh, of a whole family, mother, father, and child. After nine months after liberation, we came to America on the second displaced persons boat, settled in New York, but sh uh, shortly afterwards I became sick, spent two years in the hospital, uh, and uh, again lost uh, a lot of schooling. Uh, there's a lot in between, but I went through high school. I was an honor student in high school. That's the only school that I had finished really finished was high school. I finished high school in three years instead of four. Uh, did some summer school work to catch up. And I uh, went to college and there were sicknesses in between as a result from the camp. Uh, and I, um, yeah, the sickness was tuberculosis. Almost all the children had it. And as I said, I was two years in the hospital, years at home in bed until miracle drugs came into use. I worked for 38 years as a chemist, but during that time already I started to write. That was always my hobby. And I've written four books, nonfiction, three on my life, and one about very good friends, uh, African-American ladies who were big track stars and also very good friends of mine. I want to spend the rest of my life bringing tolerance and good feelings among people. I live in New York in a row house between a Muslim and a Hindu family and then there's a Christian family so we have the four basic religions living side by side in harmony. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the world were in reality like that, not just in a little on a little block in Queens. My hope, my wish, and prayer is for every child to grow up with peace, without prejudice, and without hunger. Born of war, it is my legacy, it is 
my legacy. Do not deny to me this burden legacy. I am a child of yours. You love me more than life, but you have closed the doors and I can't sleep at night. I've children of my own. I cannot answer them. And someday you'll be gone. Who will remember them? It is their legacy. It is their legacy. Do not deny to me their burdened legacy. I was born Geta Jaskorski in Berlin, Germany, November 5th, 1942. I was told that the Nazis would not let me keep a German name, and so I had to change it to what was conceived to be a Jewish name, so it was changed to Gattel. Um, my parents' name was Ruth Julian and Ruth Jaskolski, and um, I have some papers saying that my father was a buyer. I've heard different versions of what it meant, whether he was a bookkeeper. I'm not sure I do have like letters of recommendations and both of my parents got very high recommendations for their job performance. Uh, my mother was a seamstress, just like her mother, and her brother was a tailor. My parents had to do forced labor, so I was living with my grandparents and every night my parents would come to visit me. And one day in February of 1943, my former landlady ran up to my grandmother and said, Frau Chibo, they're being taken away. And my grandmother stood on the balcony and watched my parents being taken away by the Gestapo. At that point, they were taken to Auschwitz, and uh, I have their death certificate showing that that's where they died. I was in hiding for a while, and the nuns uh, kept me there. Interesting part of the story is that my grandfather was Catholic, and so my grandmother was protected. Uh, when he died, then a friend of the family's who worked for the underground told her that, you know, when it was evident that she was going to be taken away, that she thought my best chance for survival was to go with her. And at that point, that's when we went to Theresienstadt. So I was in a nursery. Uh, my grandmother used to have to scrub steps and the sidewalk in cold water. And I can remember growing up in winter, her hands would turn blue because of that experience. The lady, a sidelined interesting story about this is that the lady that worked for the underground had a little girl. And this lady would give my grandmother milk carts that would have milk. And one day the Gestapo were talking to the little girl and she says, oh, my mother's giving a milk cart to some Jews, which really was endangering her life by doing that. So there were people who risked their lives to help Jews out during the war. Gittel and her 66-year-old grandmother immigrated to the United States in 1951. Her grandmother had to find employment in order to survive and she attempted to raise the perfect child. My grandmother, I feel, made me a showpiece because she want, She said, I want people to see that, not, that Hitler didn't kill all of us Jews off. And so I was a showpiece. And then again, made it more of a not having a childhood. Part of the compensation from having been in a camp was to be able to come to America. And uh, my grandmother decided I would have a better chance for a good life here. So we left when I was eight. And I have to say, you know, I love my children. I don't know if I could give up my country for my kids. So that was doing a lot. And then we landed the day after I turned nine in New York. So and that was in 19, November of 1951. So we landed November 6th. And it was just so interesting as we were approaching New York, you know, we could see all the bright lights in the background. And uh, I didn't see the Statue of Liberty because they were checking out our documents down below the on board ship. So it was a long journey to come to America. We 
we flew from Berlin to Frankfurt. We, I remember staying at a military base in a barracks. Uh, I believe we part of the trip was on a truck. Then we flew from from yeah we flew to Frankfurt. Then we we went to Bremerhaven and we uh, came over here on a military ship. And I was seasick every day except the day of my birthday, so I guess the water was calmer then, so. so your grandmother was how old? Well, she was born in um, 1885, so I would have to do the math, but she was in her 60s. And she didn't know English, but the first thing she did was go to the YMCA and take English class, and she got pretty good. In order to come here, you had to have a sponsorship, and she had a document saying that she was going to be a housekeeper for someone in Hackensack, New Jersey. And I vividly remember, as young as I was, that somebody said to her one day on the ship, well, you might as well use that piece of paper for toilet paper. It means nothing because no one's going to wait that long to get domestic help. And so here you are, you know, we had to leave everything behind, maybe one suitcase of clothing. She did bring my accordion with and her sewing machine. And that's all we had. And here you are in a strange country not knowing the language. And she thought we were gonna be living, they wouldn't let us live in New York because the population was too great. So she had to decide where are we gonna to move to. We had uh, relatives in California, and uh, she didn't want them to feel like they're responsible for us, so she wouldn't move to California. So we had some old family friends that lived in Chicago, and so that's how we ended up in Chicago. In spite of all of her grandmother's efforts, Gattel's life would never be completely normal. The after effects of Nazi Germany resurfaced again and again. Certainly I didn't have a childhood. And then it, it does carry over to, you know, when I became a mother, I didn't know what a child was like, and I didn't know to read the, to kids or play with them. And I, my youngest son and his wife are the best parents in the world, and, and they're always interacting with their children. And very recently, my youngest son says, well, Mom, I just assume it's a natural thing to whatever he said. And no, it's not natural because I didn't know that. I didn't experience that. I had one doll that I brought over here from Germany. I still have that doll. And when I came here, I remember a couple ladies came to visit us and they gave me an Easter bunny and that's all I ever had. I didn't have toys like my grandchildren have. I'm there overloaded with toys and uh, games. And, you know, just all the normal things that people had that I never experienced. And even when I went to school, and when I got to a point where I made friends and I was invited to, let's say, a birthday party, I would sit and talk to a mom because my life was always with adults. And so I was always comfortable with talking to the moms, you know, and not with children. So I just did not know how to interact with them. As time went on, the horrors of Nazi Germany quickly faded from people's minds. People questioned whether the Holocaust ever happened, and discrimination showed its ugly head again. I had people tell me there's no more prejudice, and I've certainly experienced a lot of prejudice in my life. Um, the first biggest memory was that after I came back from Israel in 1981 and there was a newspaper story done about me, uh, sometime after that we came home and there was swastikas all over our front lawn that someone had put down with used car oil and it's something that you can't remove, it's there permanently and the only way to get rid of it was to tear up an entire lawn and put down new seed and regrow the grass. So the police came and they took pictures and so it was a, a big thing. I was on a job and I was threatened and harassed and I finally just had to leave the job. I felt that I couldn't deal with it and 
I shouldn't have to, so I left the job. And they really liked my work and begged me to stay, and I just, I just couldn't do it. So this is my home since 1959, and this is the yard that the swastika was put down on with used cow oil. And obviously we got rid of the evidence and things are back to normal. It wasn't until I went to Israel in 1981 and I went to a kibbutz comprised of survivors of Theresienstadt and the man found my name in the racks of documents and filled out a sheet of information on me that it hit me that I'm a survivor. I used to say my grandmother survived and my parents didn't and didn't realize, well, I'm a survivor also until I went to Israel. And so it was just not an issue for me until after that. And in 1981, my life dramatically changed. For some reason, I was prompted to go, even though I never thought of myself as a survivor. Yeah, my husband was so concerned that somebody would want to kill the rest of us survivors off, and my kids were very young. And we made that decision that they had to have at least one parent, and so I went alone. And um, powerful experience when opening ceremony and we sang Hatikva, which is the national anthem. And here I am among all these survivors. It was very emotional. Um, but because he was so concerned about somebody killing us off, I, I made pictures of all the security we had. And on the rooftop of the opening ceremony, there were all these soldiers with their guns, and I, I have pictures of that. A few years later, we went with a child survivor group to Israel, and tremendous amount of security. Everywhere we went by bus, there was uh, helicopters flying overhead, so we certainly felt very well protected. There were 15,000 children that went through the uh, camp, most of them were transported to Auschwitz and killed. 100 of us survived, and I'm one of 100 that survived. And at the kibbutz, I met two other child survivors, as we're called. Child survivor definition is anyone who was 13 or younger when the war broke out. And so we just instantly bonded. We're, especially now with email, we're able to keep in touch constantly. We're extremely close. And there was a man who helped transport children out of the camp to Auschwitz or wherever. Did not know there were young ones like us there. So he learned even in 81, all those years later, something new. There's always something new to be learned about the Holocaust. When it came to the subject of the Holocaust, my kids were extremely protective of me. As they were growing up, the movie Holocaust, there was a series that came on TV. And at the end of that series, one of my sons was told a joke I don't remember. But the end was, and all you need is an ashtray for six million Jews. And my question to people is, how do you respond to that as a human being, as a Jew, and let alone as a survivor? That, that's, that's not a joke. You have two kinds of survivors. You have the kind that talk about nothing but the survivors, of being a survivor, and then you have the kind that don't talk about it. And my grandmother, I guess, you know, protected me and didn't tell me very much. We're all getting older, and it's time's running out to tell a story, and I truly believe that it's important to tell our story, that forever the world will know and hopefully prevent anything like this ever happening again. Loved ones torn from you, not to have known at all, leave scars upon us too. Our family tree was burned 
from ashes we arose how can we ever learn if just the martyr knows it is our legacy it is our legacy do not deny to me this burden legacy it is our legacy it is our legacy you must pass on to me this burden legacy Shalom, 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 Shalom,